My name is Felina Hermans. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, where I research spreadsheets. And many of you might be thinking, why are you talking about spreadsheets at a developers conference? But spreadsheets are often mislabeled. People think of spreadsheets as being data, whereas spreadsheets actually are code. Spreadsheets are code. If you fall asleep now in your after lunch dip, that is fine with me, as long as you get the main message of this talk, which is spreadsheets are code. That's really the only thing that's very important to remember. I go all around the world with this talk to spread the gospel of my life that spreadsheets are code. So you might not immediately believe me, and I have three reasons for you why spreadsheets actually should be considered pieces of programming. And the first reason is they are used for very similar problems. As you can see here, this is an investment calculation. You put in some parameters and you get a result. Well, that, that's something you could have also built in Java or JavaScript or Objective-C if you want to make an app. It's not really spe a specialized domain for a programming language. You might as well do it in a spreadsheet. And then of course you could ask, why? Why do people do this in a spreadsheet? And I have asked people in many companies I've worked with, why are you doing it in a spreadsheet? Why aren't you using a real programming language or a real program? So it turns out, this might come as a surprise to you, it turns out that software developers are actually pretty bad at making software. So people that make these kind of spreadsheets, they have tried to obtain good software, either in their own IT department within the company, or they go to their favorite IT provider, and they say, hey, I have this investment model. Could you program it for me into software? Sure, says the IT department. That will be six months and five million dollars. And then if it were true, it wouldn't even be that bad. But usually then it is 12 months and $20 million, and it has half the features they want. So people start perceiving themselves as actually pretty good programmers compared to what they can get from the IT department. So it, it sort of makes sense from that perspective. OK, so that's the first reason. I go to great lengths to make my point. To such great lengths, in fact, that I have implemented a Turing machine in spreadsheet formulas only to prove that spreadsheet formulas are Turing complete. So you cannot now anymore say, hey, this is not a real programming language, because look at this. It is a real programming language like all the others, exactly as powerful as any other programming language out there. And many people very much like this Turing machine. It uh, went somewhat viral on the internet when uh, it appeared on Boing Boing. It brought my website down even for a little bit because so many people were visiting it. So that was a hit, at least in some obscure areas of the internet. So the second reason why you should consider spreadsheets as programming is that they suffer from typical software engineering problems. For example, only one in three spreadsheets has a manual. Spreadsheets are used by an average of 12 different people over their lifespan that averages five years. So this really sounds like the problems we have in programming, or maybe the, programs, the problems we had in programming in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, when people started to realize that the COBOL script they once built was now still 10 years later in use. So typical software engineering problems, we see them in spreadsheets as well. So in summary, the activities, the complexity, and the problems of spreadsheets are very, very similar to the problems we have in source code. Spreadsheets are code. Again, this is important. But I'm going to go further than that. Spreadsheets are not just a programming language. They are the next programming language that you should learn. Resistance to spreadsheets is futile. And since you are already here, I'm going to just assume that you want to learn to program a spreadsheet. Again, I have three reasons for that. First of all, who knows who made this picture? From what talk it is? Does anyone know? 
Yes, it's, it's from Brad Victor's talk, Inventing on Principle. And if you haven't seen it, it's really, really cool. But what Brad shows here is a concept called live programming, where on the one hand side you have the programming, the source code, and on the other hand you have the instantiation of that code. And then if you change something here, like a color, immediately it will update on the running code, so there's no edit compile cycle. Very cool, Brad, but we had that shit since VisiCalc. Spreadsheets are the first live programming because you just change your formula and you immediately get the result. You don't have to go to another screen. You don't have to wait for compilation. Secondly, spreadsheets are purely functional. Somehow Haskell is, is back in fashion and everyone suddenly likes functional programming. But you know what's also functional programming? Excel. It's pure functional programming. If you look at a, a formula in a spreadsheet, the only thing a formula can do is get data from other cells and give a value. It's impossible for a spreadsheet formula to create a side effect, to, to make a change to a different cell. That's impossible. So it's a pure functional system. Who knew? Thirdly, why you should absolutely learn spreadsheet programming is Everyone knows it but us, really. Spreadsheets are the most popular programming language in the history of everything. Everyone knows it. Like your next door neighbor is managing his fantasy football team in a spreadsheet. Your accountant is probably doing your taxes in a spreadsheet. Everyone knows this except us developers. We say, eh, that's not real programming. Everyone. So it's time to change that and Surprise, surprise, this session is going to help you learn some spreadsheet programming. So, to convince you how cool Excel is, I'm going to implement selection sort in a spreadsheet to show you how you can properly program. Who knows how selection sort works? Okay, not everyone, let me explain it. The idea of selection sort is that you sort a list of numbers, or you could sort anything, but we're sorting numbers this time, by taking, oh, this will be tricky with only one hand. <laughs> can I get an, oh, you can be my assistant, Eric. That's fine as well, you can be my assistant. <laughs> so you can hold this for a minute. Oh, oh no, you go right over, oh, this is more fun than normal. Yes, you can just stay here. You're holding the first item in the list. Ah. So you're, this is the first item in the list. And the way we're going to sort the list is we look at the first item and we search for the minimum in the list. We take the minimum and then, this is your cue, and then we swap the minimum. <laughs> yeah, you can just use your hand. So we swap the minimum. Yes, yeah, so I'm the minimum, you're the first element. We swap them. Yes, perfect. So we swap them and then we go to the next element. So every time we take the first element, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to try it? Should it be working? Test, test, hello. Is this working? Yes? Okay. Uh, yes, okay. I'll finish it with one earring then. Selection sort. We're going to sort a list of numbers by repeatedly swapping the minimum and the first value. So here I've just put the index. I've just put all the numbers there because it will be easier for us to know the index of every number in our array. So the first thing we need for selection sort is the minimum of the list. And luckily Excel has a built-in function for that. We take the minimum of this range. And what we can do here, here is the first trick that probably you already didn't know. Instead of using the range, we can also just use the entire row. So some people have seen this, this for columns. So you do A, colon, B, and then you have two columns. But you can also do it for rows. And this is not that important now, but all the way at the end of the implementation, we are going to need this trick. And this is why I show it to you now. So we use the minimum. And what we need then is the index of the minimum. We need to know where is the index of this minimum because we have to find it in order to be able to swap it. And Excel has a nice function for that called match, which is going to look for that value in this range. There we go. So the value 1 is on the position 10. And that's correct here. We have 1, it's on position 10. So step by step, we're going to go through the algorithm. So let's first look at 
when are we going to swap? And initially, I'm just going to mark the swap spots with an X and the other ones with an underscore in order for you to be more easily able to follow me. So if the index is equal to the index of the minimum, then we have to swap. And otherwise, for now, we're going to use an underscore. So we can take the formula. Zoop, ah, we didn't get an X on the position of the minimum. Does anyone know what went wrong here? What did I forget? Dollar signs, yes. If you drag a formula in Excel, if you drag it to the left, all the references will be automatically updated. So if we select this cell, you see that it's now taking this minimum, but also looking at the cell before it instead of looking at this one. So what we can do to prevent that is we can put in a dollar sign right here, and then this column will be fixed. So if you drag the formula, it will not be updated. And if we use that, we get a nice little X right over there. So this is a spot we know now that we're going to swap. And I'm going to also introduce a dollar there because later on we're going to drag it all down and we want to keep pointing at the index row. So let me just put that dollar there. I don't need another quiz for that. Okay, so we need to reverse now as well. We have the location of the minimum, but we also need the location of where are we going to swap. So initially, we're going to swap with the first value. If you remember my sweet assistant holding the first index, that's here. So now we need the reverse operation of the match because we have the location, but we want to know the value at that location. And there's a function in Excel for that as well called index that gives you from these ra this range the value of this column and that, uh, this row, I'm sorry, and that column. So it's going to look what is on the first place. We get 13. So we have both components now. We know the value of the first item and the location, that's the first, and the value of the minimum and the location of the minimum. So let's first now look at this underscore because it's easier. We at what places do we not have to swap? Well, that's pretty easy. We're going to swap if the index is equal to the index of the minimum or if the index is equal to the index of the swap. And in all other cases, we're not doing anything. There we go. We have two swap locations now. So we're getting close. We have no numbers yet. But at least we know that the structure of our conditions makes sense because we have marked the spots with x's. So let's fill in this part first. What value do we get if we're not swapping? Any takers? The yes, the value from the previous row. That's pretty easy. So we can just point up and drag it down. And you see for all of the values where we're not swapping, we're just taking the previous row. And then we still have two x's that we need to fill out. So I'm going to add some conditional formatting here just for to make it a bit easier for you to see what's going on. So I select the swap, make the swap value uh, um, green and the minimum value yellow. So it's just easier to see what's going on. So what are we going to place here? If our value is equal to the index swap value, what do we need here in place of this x? The minimum, correct. There we go. If we're equal to the swap value, we take the minimum. And in the other situation, if we're equal to the minimum, we take the swap value. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Selection sort. Let's take it and drag it down. Oh, the coloring already shows you that something strange is happening. So what did I forget here? What went wrong? Yes. Yes, very well. So you see in the minimum, I keep taking one because I take the minimum of just this range. Well, Excel's got you covered, no worries, because there's something that's called the offset function that moves a range o over the grid. So I can take this range and I can say, in the first situation, I'm going to offset it with zero, so this minus one. 
And then I'll offset it with one, and with two, and with three, and with four. And then I always get the minimum of the part of the array that is not sorted yet. So if we do that, ta 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 ta, isn't that nice? Selection sort. But it is not very readable yet. So I got you covered. Let's make it a little bit nicer, a little bit easier on the eyes, because I'm not going to convince a crowd of developers with cell references. So let's make it nicer. However, in order for us to make it nicer, we have to go really into the scary depths of what is possible in Excel. So we have to go a little bit scarier, but we will, we will come out nicely in the end. So a question, and this question is nicely related to the topic of GoToConf, because it, the topic is space, and this crazy formula I have here has a space in it. And <laughs> you could also say, if I explain this syntax to you, you can definitely say that we are boldly going where no one has gone before. <laughs> it's inner space, not outer space. <laughs> awesome, sir. So does anyone know what this funky syntax means? OK, that's no problem. I didn't know it initially. If I select it, maybe you get a little hint of where we're going. No? So what this means is two ranges, the intersection of the two ranges. Why, Microsoft? Why is space? Why not just intersect and then the two ranges? In many other places in the language, spaces can be ignored. So you can have a function name, and then you can put spaces in between. In the arguments, it's all fine. So in many places, it's white space independent, except for this. How do you know that, Feline? Well, I wrote a grammar for the Excel formulas. This is how I found out. That was quite hard because of this funky thing. But it's there, and we can use it in a pretty nice way to make our selection sort a little bit nicer. Because what we can do is if we make this range into a name train. So we just give this these bunch of cells, we give it a name. So they are now called index. And what we can do then, if we're in a specific cell, instead of pointing directly at that E2, we can say we want to have the intersection of, in, of the index range and the column we are in now. So instead of directly pointing at E2, we say we want to have the intersection between the column we are in and the named range of index, which is pretty nice because that means you can combine things. And this E here is optional, because it's already in the range we are in. So if we remove it, it will still work. So we can say from here, index means index at the position that we are. And we don't have to name it. If we repeat this trick, because we name this index min and min and index swap and swap, we can turn this into this. Isn't that nice? It's, it's almost self-documenting. If the index is index min, we swap. And if the index is index swap, it's the minimum. Yeah, it's like one thing, that E3, that is ugly. We have to get rid of it, but we can't use the same trick because it won't be in the same row all the time because if we're dragging down, we continuously need the one row before us. So we want to get rid of that ugly E3, and we need even more spreadsheet magic to make that happen. Bear with me. We're going to go a little bit deeper into the concept of named ranges, like the ones, the index and the min and the min swap we used. You can do some pretty nifty tricks using named ranges if you know what you're doing. So here I'm going to make a named range for this cell, uh, like we did before. However, instead of having it point to a specific cell address, we may also put in something like a constant. So we can define all you need is love. And then we can use that name range. All you need is love. And if you use it, it looks like this. Love is all you need. Isn't that nice? It's so nice. It's poetry in a formula. We can go a bit further than that. There are other songs that I happen to like that we can also express using 
funky name ranges. For example, Paolo Nutini has a wonderful song that contains this lyric. However much I love you, you will always love me more. Let's model that. It's a work of art. So, we start with a law of constant. Let's say 15 is how much I love you. So we just put in a constant like we did with the string before. And we can make a second constant, your love, that depends on my love. So I put a formula in, and that formula uses another name range. It's really, it's like programming. So your love is 1.3 times my love. There we go. Ta, 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 ta. So you have a, f a name range. It looks like a name range, like a name, but it has a formula inside of it that depends on another name range. I need a little bit more magic. One more layer of magic and then I'm done, I promise. Let's look at this song by famous Dutch DJ Armin van Buren. It's called Every Day I Love You More. So this is a bit more elaborate than the previous song because that was just one in direction. You love, I, lo I love, you love more. But now it needs to get more <laughs> every day. So we need a little bit more magic. Let's again say our love starts at 15. And what we can use is a row function. And a row function, you can put in a cell address, so you can say the row of B4 is 4. But if you use it without an argument, you get the current row. So the row we are in now. And we can use that to make a dependency to the cell above us. Because we can say yesterday's love is the address, so we're going to make a cell reference to the row above us and the same column. So now we have the cell above. So the, the cell above us is C4. However, what we have now is a string. So it's not yet the cell address. And what Excel has is a function called indirect, which is a little bit like evil in JavaScript, where you can put in a string and you get the result of whatever that is. That is what this is too. You put in a string and then you get the reference of what is on that cell. So intuitively, it feels like just stripping off the quote, so you get a cell reference. So these two things are equivalent. And we can use that, because we now have the address of the cell above us, to turn it into a reference. There we go. Yesterday's love is the indirect of the cell above us in the same column. Ta-da! The value in the cell above us will always work. But of course, we're not done yet, because now our love stays constant every day. That's a bit sad. It needs to go up. Otherwise, it doesn't specify the lyric requirement. So we just add the Van Buren factor of uh, 1.004. <laughs> I don't know how much he loves everyone more every day. So if you put that in, we drag it down. We have a formula in the name range that depends on the cell above it. So all these cells, the interface doesn't really show it clearly, but all these cells contain exactly this formula. However, everywhere we call it, it is different. Ta-da! That's magic, right? <laughs> so we can use that to, so for our, to make our selections so more beautiful. Because I didn't come here to talk about love, I come here to talk about selection sorts. So that E3 it can go now with the new techniques that we just learned. Because what we can do is we can make a reference to the previous row. So the row, and this is, remember in the beginning I told you, this funky syntax where you can use one row at one time, that's what I use here. So I make a reference to the entire row above me by saying the row above me and then a colon and then again the row above me. So I can change that now, and then if I use that, it will always point to the row above me. If I drag it down, it will always point to the row above me. So all these cells can have the exact same formula because it will point to the row above me. Isn't that nice? It really reads like a novel. If the index is equal to the index minimum, then swap. And if the index is equal to the index swap, then the minimum, otherwise the previous row. I think it's a work of art. Just for comparison, I also made selection sort in Python. It looks like this. I don't know what I think is more elegant. Okay, I do know what I think is more elegant. Look at that, it's just one line and it's consistent everywhere. And as a, as a free bonus, which sort of sounds like a joke, but it's actually pretty, a pretty deep insight, is you get 
all the data here. So you can look at the data and the programming at the same time. Whereas if you're in Python, it's quite hard to see what you're are you are running it on. You would need text, you, uh, tests in sort of an alternative interface. You would have your data, whereas here, especially for prototyping, you can immediately see what is going on. And if you use the conditional formatting, it is even easier. So it's a really nice way, if you know what you're doing, to specify algorithms, because you will have that live programming aspect that Brad Victor talks about. You immediately get your feedback in view without lots of compi uh, uh, compilation cycles and without a big cognitive distance between what you're doing and how you're thinking about it. So you might think, yes, but you spent hours and hours and hours thinking about the most beautiful example to do programming in Excel. That is true. I admit it. <laughs> I admit it. That is very much true. However, once you're in this mindset, actually Excel becomes a really nice tool to think about these type of problems. So this is me last September on the weekend getaway where with friends where we were participating in a programming competition where we had to solve some of the Euler puzzles, which are mathematical quizzes that you can solve with programming. So we did some of the puzzles, and for example, this is Pascal's triangle in Excel, and it is, it's really very easy to quickly generate Pascal's triangle, and for, for one of the Euler puzzles, we needed to have the search and search number. So you make it, you start with one, this column stays the same, and all the others are just adding the two adjacent cells, and you drag it down, and you have Pascal's triangle. And if you look at other solutions, for example, this is how it looks like in C, and this is how it looks like in F sharp, it, it's really quite concise and elegant to do it in a spreadsheet. You just need the two formulas. You don't need to think about what data structure am I going to represent a triangle in, how would it look like, because your interface and your data structure are right there, and that's a decision you don't have to make anymore. And here's another example where we did dynamic programming in a spreadsheet where you have on the one hand, uh, on sheet one, you have your input data, and on sheet two, it gets very easy to just calculate the maximum of whatever you can obtain in this path plus the value that we're going to get in, this, in the cell that we're in. And again, for comparison, this is how it looks in C, and this is how it looks in Haskell, whereas in Excel, you just need the one formula. So yes, it took me a very long time to craft a few examples, but once you know how to do it, it's actually a very, very good tool. And the friend I was programming with that first proposed we should do everything in Haskell, even, okay, this took a few hours, but at one point admitted that some things were actually very easy to do in a spreadsheet. So. You might think, why, why, why are you doing all these things? That, that is a fair question. And now we're going on to what is actually my real job, because this is all like my hobby. Because the idea of the research that I'm doing at Delft University of Technology is answering this question. If spreadsheets are programming, and I'm sure all of you are convinced, a logical question to ask is, could we then use methods from software engineering and apply them on the domain of spreadsheets? Would it make sense to think about spreadsheets in that way? And I actually wrote a PhD dissertation on this topic, on transforming methods from software engineering to spreadsheets. And the quick summary is, yes, we can. We can very easily use methods that we know that work in software engineering and use them on spreadsheets instead. So I'm going to give two examples of tools we build to help people to improve their spreadsheets. So one of the things we build is called Bumblebee, and it's a refactoring tool for spreadsheets. It makes sense. If it's source code, you need an IDE, right? So what it does is it's a plugin into Excel. Here you see it. And if you select a formula that is smelly, that is a little bit that is not well chosen, for example, this one, the sum of a range divided by the count of a certain range, maybe someone would know how to more easily do that. Average, yes. But uh, so maybe this person wasn't aware of the average function. Uh, for average, maybe that's not very an assumption you can make, but there are lots of complicated formulas that people might just not know about. 
Or an alternative situation is that it just started with a sum, and then someone said, oh, you need to divide it by a count, and it evolved over time without people realizing that they could also use built-in formulas. So our plugin can detect that, highlight these smelly cells, and then even suggest you rewrites. So we can say, hey, you could apply the sum and count to average refactoring, and you get a nice little preview of how your formula would look like. And if you like that, you could say, okay, well, apply it for me. And then it automatically refactors your formula. And these transformations are entirely programmable with a little language that looks like spreadsheet formulas. So we have a number of built-in refactorings, but you could also define your own refactorings. So here, for example, um, here you have the refactoring I just showed you, the sum of something divided by the count of something. You can rewrite that to the average of something. And we think that more powerful end users that also write VB code could be able to write these type of transformations. And then you also can go beyond the realm of refactoring. It doesn't necessarily have to be behavior preserving anymore. You could also write transformation rules that, for instance, implement new business rules. So you used to calculate a loan based on income, and now you want to calculate it based on income and age as well, oh, you write a rewrite rule and you can automatically transform all the spreadsheets you have in a consistent way. So that's something we're currently exploring. And this is available. If you want to try it out, you can go to my website and download it. It's just for Excel, unfortunately, just for Windows. So you can try it, you can play with the transformation rules, add your own new transformations, and see if you like it, or advise people you know that use spreadsheets a lot to use it. And then, of course, after we did a refactoring tool, if you say refactoring, you say testing. Yes, correct. If you're going to refactor your spreadsheet, then, of course, you want to also test your spreadsheet. Because maybe you, if you're changing formulas, especially if they're not necessarily behavior preserving, at least you want to know that they keep satisfy your tests. And the interesting thing here is that this was a typical ivory tower mistake that I made. I thought in the beginning, yeah, but it's already so hard to get normal developers to test and to convince management of developers that testing is something you should spend time on. So how on earth are we going to get spreadsheet developers to test? Well, turns out they are actually already pretty good testers. So we found many formulas like this. So this is something that s someone put in themselves. If the sum of these guys is not 100, then I will output error. And otherwise, I'll output 100%. This is really like a test. And because there's no n unit or j unit for spreadsheets, what do people use? Well, they use formulas. But you could definitely say this is a test. This is writing an assertion that these should always sum up to 100 or error. And we found lots of formulas like this. And of course, you can exploit that. If people already have these type of formulas in their spreadsheet, you can extract them into a test suite. So that's exactly what our tool does. It's called Expector. It's somewhere hidden behind this nice lamp. Expector. And what you can do is you can find existing tests in a spreadsheet. And then it's going to look at the entire spreadsheet. And it says, hey, I found something that looked like a test. The cell on questionnaire D10 expresses that the sum of these guys should be 100. And then if you agree that that is indeed what you wanted to test, you can say, OK. And you have a test suite that you can now run. So you can run the test, and it says, ha, huh, one of one passed. This is indeed 100%. Isn't that nice? And in addition to that, you can also show coverage. Once you have a test suite, you can do all the things. So you can say, OK, show me what is tested. These cells are tested, because we argue the test cell is tested, and also all the cells that this cell depends on are also tested. Of course, this is a very loose definition of coverage. We're not talking branch coverage here or statement coverage. We're just looking at what area of your spreadsheet at least is covered by some test. And if this is something we assume, if this is something that people are used to, then maybe we can get to the level also of branch coverage where you have if statements and you need more tests for them to be fully tested. What we also have here is we want to help people to add new tests. Because it's not that easy to know 
what you should test. So we have three sort of simple options. You can test the complex formula, a formula with a large value, or a formula that has lots of cells before it in the calculation chain. So hey, you want to test a complex formula? Well, I found something for you that looks pretty complex. This is there's a lot of nesting going on here. Maybe this is something you want to test. And then you can say, yes, I want that. You click Make Tests, and then you, here you can specify some simple things. So you can say it should be a number, it should be a text, an upper value, a lower value again. We don't necessarily need the richness of tests that you would use for software, because the, the scenario is different. We want to keep it as simple as possible, at least for this for this point in time. So you can set some thresholds and save it, and it says, ha, oh, look at that, you've increased your coverage from 6% to 8%. We try to make it a little bit appealing for people to add more tests. And then now you have three tests in your test suite that you can pass. So the sum, the, the one we already have, and now we also have these two. And this two is available from my website, and actually, sur surprisingly, even to me, this is going really well. So over a thousand people have already installed our plugin and are continuously trying to test their spreadsheets and working with it. So for research, it's really interesting to see the, if these type of patterns match the type of patterns that you see in regular software testing. There are plugins like this for, for instance, Eclipse, a plugin that's also made by my research group is called Watchdog that the the detects the type of test behavior that you're doing. So when you test, when you update a test, when you run a test. And it would be very interesting to see if the patterns between software developers and spreadsheet developers are similar in terms of testing and in what cases they are different. So that's more or less all I wanted to talk about. Before we go to questions, because we have some time for questions, I will quickly summarize my entire talk in under a minute. So if you missed anything, because I know it's right after lunch, so maybe you're sleeping, maybe you went to a nice pub yesterday night. So this is your second chance to get the entire talk, at least the gist of it. And if you were paying attention, of course, this is optimal preparation for question asking. So the one sentence summary, spreadsheets are code. Remember this and tell all your friends and never, ever, ever again say to someone who's building a spreadsheet, you're not a real programmer. Because spreadsheets are used for similar programs, they are Turing complete, and they suffer, suffer from typical software engineering problems. They're not just a programming language, they are new and hip and happening, they are live, they are purely functional, and you could even almost say, despite those two things, they are known by everyone. So I showed you that by implementing selection sort in a spreadsheet in quite an elegant way, if I might say so, may say so. And my research is about applying methods from software engineering to spreadsheets, because if they're code, that totally makes sense. And for that, I build a refactoring tool and a testing tool that you can download from my website. If you want more information, this is my personal website where I talk about research and you can download my tools. This is the, wor uh, the website of the research group I run where I force a bunch of grad students to also like this. And if you want to know more, you can, again, you can send me a tweet. Also, I will be here all day, also at the party. So feel free to, talk about, to approach me if you want to talk about it. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also send me an email. Any questions? Anything on the interwebs? Oh, lots of things. Is this about Excel only or also about Calc? And this is also about other tools. So, of course, the ideas that I presented are very much generic. You could use them for any spreadsheet system. However, we only implemented for it for Excel because, well, that's just a de facto standard and we want to build tools that people use so we can monitor their behavior. So, unfortunately, it's not really research work to implement for lots of different systems that wouldn't be necessarily something I would be rewarded for. But some parts of our core uh, are open source. For example, the grammar I talked about is on GitHub. You can use it. And well, if you want to build something, that might be a good start. Oh, this is a nice question. What about version control, diffing, and merging? <laughs> So I'll say two things about that. First of all, there's a British startup called Git, 
uh, called spread Git, which is exactly what you think it is. It's, it's Git for spreadsheets. Um, so that is something, if you really want to know it, to look at. And also, I know this is sort of a curse word in this community, but the newest versions of SharePoint are actually really good at doing version control for spreadsheets. You can do authorization on worksheet level and on cell level, and you can also see different versions there. And, and this is used in the type of situations that also spreadsheets are used. So partly, this problem is quite nicely addressed by SharePoint. Um, oh yeah, the same, sort of the same question again. Is it only possible in Excel or also open source software? I already answered that. We often develop with several devs in a single software, cooperation within spreadsheets. So again, that would be something that SharePoint or Google Docs would, would partly address. But also the scenario is a little bit different because typically people that make a spreadsheet, I said of course in the beginning that a spreadsheet was used by 12 different people, but that's typically not at the same time. So these spreadsheets aren't developed together. What typically happens is someone makes a nice version and then the guy in the next office says, oh, can I have that spreadsheet too? And then there too, and then sort of development happens independently. So really together working on a spreadsheet, I haven't seen it that much. And I don't know if that is because the tools really don't support it or because the process of end user programming is very much goal driven. So people aren't really necessarily concerned with maintenance and testing, they really, they want to get the job done, which is usually a personal goal and not, not necessarily a company goal. So, I don't know. Anything else? <laughs> Am I preparing a book of design patterns? Well, in, in a sense, my dissertation is sort of a book about design patterns. So I talked here mainly about the work on refactoring and testing. But before that, there was lots of work. Actually, that's almost half of my dissertation about smell detection in spreadsheets. And then if you describe what smells are, then you have anti-patterns and you have patterns. So if, you're, if you would really be interested in it, it, is, it, the PDF is also on my website. So it's pretty nice to read if you want to know more. Yeah. Another one, you claimed that uh, Excel has high order functions. Does it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you, yeah, so again, read my blog, I made a, I made a post about it. Um, so if, if you hack it a little bit. So a similar trick I used with the, with the formulas in the name ranges, you can use that to mimic higher order functions because you can make a list of functions somewhere on the hidden worksheet and then the, you, the function you use could output a reference to one of those cells. So you could say then, what I'm outputting is a function, and then you can apply that on yet another cell. So, and I, I made, an, I, I wrote a quite extensive blog post about how exactly that works with an example spreadsheet you can download. So, I recommend you read that. But then, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say this is something you, you you should use. I say it is something if you're interested in the theory that you could do if this is your job. I'm not recommending this for production, just like fair disclaimer. If in a year then there are horrible errors, then don't come crying. <laughs> yeah. So I'm convinced now that uh, Excel is code or spreadsheets are code, uh, but they are also data, right? They combine the data and the code. Isn't that a problem? And can we separate it somehow? So, so that you can have the general selection sort and then the data applied to the input. Yeah, that's a very good question. So. Like many of the things I think in spreadsheets, this is sort of a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it's really nice that you're co-developing your algorithm and your data, uh, as you see me sort of doing the selection sort, but then you would want to extract only the functionality and sort of split it. Um, it would be maybe an interesting avenue for research to do that. However, a problem there is that people really like it, especially if they're not trained like us for abstractions, it's not very easy to do that. And what many people might not know is that actually Microsoft Access was sort of aimed to do that. So Access is an end user programming database. 
this is what Microsoft thought when they released it, that it was really for the same people that use Excel could also use Access. It's for a database for the general public. However, my ex I didn't really research this, but my experience working with people in banks and insurance companies is that that is a big gap. Like Everyone is on the Excel side, and a few people are able to go to a database. A few people are able to think about, OK, so first I design, first I write down my metadata, and then I write data, and then I write calculations on, on top of it in three different views. That's not something everyone can do. So if you would want to make something to split out the data and the calculations, somehow, and I don't know, I wouldn't know how, you would have to overcome the problem that you're f introducing abstractions to people who've never seen that. So I don't know if many people would be able to make the jump. Yes. Oh, so we have to wait for the microphone. <laughs> don't always pop my, my lovely assistant is rushing over, otherwise the people on the video can hear you. So what's easy? Uh, to teach developers to build formulas on Excel or to teach people to actually program it on Python or something like that? Ah, that's a very good question. Well, it depends on the person and also on the goal, of course. So it, it's probably best if we approach it from both sides. So I really, really sincerely believe that if developers know a little bit of spreadsheeting, they can make, in some cases, it's better to make a spreadsheet for someone that needs a tool than to make a system, because then it will be customizable and it will have all the benefits. So that's sort of, de if developers would come a little bit to the spreadsheet side, that'd be good. But also, in some cases, and it's, it's nice that you mentioned Python and also pr uh, a programming language like R, there are programming languages that make it to a broader audience. And again, I don't really know why Python is adopted so well by, for example, biologists and st statisticians. I don't know what, what, what Python has that Java doesn't. There, Of course, there are many differences. I don't know where the difference lies. So we could try to learn from that. What, what programming languages fit end users better? So it really depends on what you're doing, I think. Because one of the things that you're mentioning is that we're going to have a lot of impedance between what you are actually processing on and what you see as the processing uh, output. So programming language plus the visualization. So for IPython notebooks, for example, you can even have documentation and yeah. execution and all that in the same spreadsheet. That definitely say. has some of the benefits of l live programming and easy execution. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know. I mean we can share intuitions, but I haven't done research on exactly what it is, so I don't know. Um, so I think it r it's a sort of a boring answer, but it really depends. In some situations, a spreadsheet is fine. In some situations, you might want to need, want to learn some programming. I mean, not everyone will need that. Sometimes it's just enough to be able to do some quick offhand calculation. Okay, if there are no more questions, I thank Philin for a great talk. Thanks. I've certainly learned a lot.